Ska vi börja? Vi är redo. Okay, good morning. Happy to see so many people up here to today. The thing is, there's been a party yesterday. Uh, and I won't blame anyone, but I think people are a bit tired. Uh, but still, we do have our magnificent um, uh, speakers here today. We have one that will be with us uh, by stream because of COVID, but he's still so interested in this, so he will be here with us uh, live still. My name is Anna Moss Fransen. I'm a logistics expert at Vasa Region Development Company. I have the honor to moderate this session today. Uh, the, the uh, session is arranged by a Botany Atlantica project called, and this is long, I did it not come up with this name, but it's good, FAIR, Finding Innovations to Accelerate Implementation of Electric Regional Aviation. Now, I've been part of regional development for some time now, and we've gone through cross-border cooperation, international cooperation, and so forth, and now we reach electric aviation, and that's really exciting, I think. Um, today, we will take you on board and discuss and learn more about future opportunities and challenges, and as well, hear about a live existing case of today. First up, uh, I will say hello to Jerome. Welcome. You are a senior design researcher at RICE, uh, Research Industry of Sweden. Jerome, it says in your presentation on our webpage that you want to make the world a little bit more beautiful, sustainable, and um, there was something inclusive. Please tell us how you can do this when it comes to electric aviation. Welcome. Hello. Yeah, great. Great. Thank you for that introduction. Uh, yes, yeah, so my name is Jeroen, and I have the pleasure to be the first speaker of the FAIR group uh, today and introduce you a little bit about the project, a little bit about what we at RISE have been doing within the project, and then I'll hand it over to the next speakers to tell you even more. Um, so I think we should just start. That's me. Right, so the FAIR project is about finding innovations to accelerate implementation of electric regional aviation. And for yours, those of you who are a little bit less familiar with the project, even if it's been running for about two years, maybe even a little bit more, I will just sketch a little bit what this project is about. So it is preparing specifically the Kvarken region and also northern Norway uh, for an early implementation of electric aviation. So it's looking at this from several different angles, uh, trying to increase the knowledge base and the components network so that we know how to do it and who needs to be involved, uh, investigating uh, the possibilities and the needs, uh, also from a technical point of view, what we need. Um, and it's very much a first step that will spin off in different ways to make this hopefully a reality. There's three work packages in the project. Uh, there's the regional effects of electric aviation studied by Umeå University, University of Vasa and Nord Universiteit. So the project has actually been, because of its success so far, has been expanded to include Northern Norway as well. Uh, we have the guidelines for implementation, work package two, looking also very much on a technical point of view. Uh, by uh, Biofuel Region uh, and Metskandia University. And then we have the cross-border innovation process uh, that is our responsibility at RISE. And you will hear a lot more about all of this <laughs> today, but just to sketch the context. Uh, and we are also very lucky to have so many uh, financiers and supporters within this project uh, coming from both public and private sector and all over this geographical area. Uh, which is really good. And of course, the project, the project is owned by Quark and Rodet and uh, is partly financed by the Interreg uh, system. And one sort of disclaimer, <laughs> in a way, but a, a positive one, before we start, uh, is to sketch that this electric aviation uh, is actually quite near. It's not that far off. Uh, when we're talking about small electric airplanes, maybe 9 to 19 passengers, uh, those are full-on in development right now, and they will be on the market very soon, as you can see here. And you will hear a little bit more about the history and the future of electric aviation, also from a technical point of view. Uh, 
But I think it's important that you understand that we are not talking about something that will take so many, many, many more years to be reality, but it's, it's very close. Uh, and this is why the project, uh, the FAIR project is also so exciting, I think. Good. That was the general introduction, and now I will share some of our work uh, at RISE, coming back to your introduction of me also. Um, I'm responsible for the innovation process in FAIR. And the objective with the innovation process is to develop speculative proposals to give shape to this regional electric aviation, to wonder a little bit and imagine a little bit what this future could be like, uh, so that we can sort of start to think outside the box, maybe. Uh, to challenge the way that things are and trigger imagination in all of you, uh, but also in all of the other people that we get in contact with through the project, to see how we can sort of catalyze this future of electric aviation from different points of view. And what I can share with you today are two concrete prototypes that we have made. Uh, one is the Volta booking application, and the other one is the FAIR soundscape. I will give a sneak peek of both of them to you right now, but if you want to know more, uh, please follow us uh, on the project website or come talk to us. The first one is Volta, and it's trying to answer one possible answer to the question, what could it be like to book flexible on-demand regional electric aviation? How would that work? If that is made possible, perhaps, by electric airplanes, how, how, how could we imagine that working and being? What could it be like? So we developed a, a working prototype. You can uh, check it out on the link below, even on your phone, and it, sh it should work. You can try it out. And it's imagining uh, a couple of key things to be different when you book uh, an electric airline trip. Uh, so first you book to an address. You book from address to address. So you can also see uh, there you put in an address. And when you have booked a flight, you also book from the address to the airport and back again. So it's not from airport to airport and sorted out the rest of it yourself. It's connected. But the main thing is that there is no schedule because it's flexible and on-demand. So there's no uh, regular schedule of when flights are leaving. Uh, you negotiate it with other passengers. So in the middle here on the slide, you can see how someone is selecting four seats and setting a range of when they are available to go. Uh, in the background, you can see other people's availability and the system would have some way of uh, figuring out between them uh, when would be an optimum time for the plane to leave being full. And the price would be adjusted based on your flexibility. Now clearly this is not the perfect solution <laughs> for anything. <laughs> That's not the point. Uh, but we're asking questions about what it could be like uh, and trying to see a bit where the friction with the current systems exist. For example, in terms of regulation or business models so that we can also consider how do, if, uh, if and how do we want to change them. And now I'll try to uh, explain the other uh, prototype, which is the soundscape. And this is answering the question with one possible answer of what could regional electric aviation sound like? So we have created a soundscape. It's, it's almost done. We're just trying to put it out now, uh, which is kind of like an old school radio play. So it's a first-person experience where you hear yourself going on a trip from Lixele to Vasa in 2040. Um, and I'll, I'll just start by sketching that context a little bit.
välkomnar samtliga passagerare ombord för Volta flyg 472 mot Vasa. Gå till gate B. Right, you you imagining yourself a little bit in Faza Airport or Lixla Airport, sorry, and the drone that got you there, the eVTOL. So of course we're trying to speculate a little bit, and this will be one consistent kind of experience where you can hear yourself going on this trip and and wondering and imagining the things that you come across when you do it. Um, but we got to an interesting point when we actually started to get to the part where you are traveling in an electric airplane because they are supposed to be much quieter when they arrive soon. So how do you make something sound that is actually much more quiet than what we're used to? And what we developed was a concept that actually uh, creates a kind of ambience in the airplane by sonifying the landscape that you fly over in a kind of abstract way, but creating a sort of a calming experience based on the landscape that you are flying over. So I'm just going to give you a sneak peek of that as well. Right, okay, so this will be available soon as one whole thing that we will also use, of course, as a way to communicate to the wider public and get them engaged and wonder about this future that we are all working towards. Um, that's all I have for you today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jerome. I have to go home and teach my kids a new sound when we're playing with airplanes. Um, before, let's see if we have a question here in the, uh, among uh, the audience, but tell me, why is this important to make these kind of um, soundscapes and all these things besides all the technical parts? Um, yeah, that's a good question, I think. I, I realize it's a little bit strange uh, within the context of projects maybe that are on a, have a large emphasis on the technical part. And of mm. course... The technical part, the policy part, uh, uh, many different uh, parts are important in a fair project, but we believe it's also important to trigger creativity and to mm. try to reimagine what the future could be like, uh, not in sort of incrementally uh, exchanging, for example, just the drivetrain, uh, but that technology to fully use it and to use the potential of it for regional uh, development also means to reconsider all aspects of that whole system. And if we can do that, uh, we can do that in different ways. And one of them, I believe, is also with creativity and design to try uh, maybe strange things out, but spur some discussion uh, that help us redefine what we really want. Yeah, interesting. Do you have any questions from the audience? No? In that case, thank you, Jerome. You're welcome. Next up, we have Lars Westin from uh, Serum, Umo University. You're a professor in regional economics. Now, when we work together through the years in different projects, I realize that you are not that black and white. You see many different potentials in development. Uh, and today you're going to talk about the, let's see, the fall and, no, the rise and the fall of regional aviation. But I think you will bring something else. Maybe we see a rise. Let's see. Please. Yeah, okay, thank you for that introduction. Oh, Jerome is not here, it's me, yes. <laughs> so so Jero, what Jerome nicely talks about is you try to see what will this future be. And I'm looking a little back to see on the policy and also to see what has uh, we had before uh, in, in regional aviation. And as I will show you is that we actually have had uh, uh, ongoing aviation already with the fossil type of, of um, uh, aircrafts. 
But uh, oh, the, so the question here is: um, Will now, when we come with the new electric aviations, will that imply that we directly will have regional aviation? Will we have the nice trips we can do as Jerome shows from Luxembourg via Umeå to Vasa or Skellefteå to uh, to Jakobstad or so, whatever we want to go, or will the current development within aviation that is very large scale, large airports and large aircraft and global flows and so that has come into priority, will that dominate? So the question actually is can, can aviation have a role within so, sort of regional public transport policy for the Kvarken region? Can we develop a new sort of, of a public uh, transport system for this region? So first I'll talk about the rise of renal aviation. And actually, if you, the, the airport in Umeå came after the airport in Vasa, but it came in 1960s. So. But already in, the, already in the beginning of, of 61, 62, this picture is from 65, um, uh, Finnair had a, a regular um, airline from Umeå to Vasa and so on. So it was possible to go over with, with the aviation between Umeå and Vasa far beyond where the ferries came. So this was a regular annual trip that was possible. The, the ferries was in the, in the summertime, so the non-ice time. And uh, still in 1999, we had this type of, of, uh, of, of roughly, I haven't got exactly which year this was for, and uh, that's a, a regular timetable for flying between Umeå and Vasa and with connections to other cities and so. So this is really what the sort of system that we would like to have. This was not sustainable. I mean, Finet, Finet did a very good job until 1990 when the deregulation comes and, so on, and lots of changes in the aviation market. And then many small companies try to establish sort of regional uh, network where Vasa, Umeå, Skellefteå, Sundsvall and so other places were involved. But that was not sustainable. And there were also lots of visions at that time about developing a Nordic airline network system. Lots of thoughts was made about that. Um, let's see. But instead, we had this development from the network of Nordic network from 1960, from 1992, and so on. When you see the typical pattern developing, that we have a much more hub and spoke, so we, as we say, that if there were no, some very large airports from which and to which most of the f uh, flights are going. So let's say uh, capitals dominate more and more. And that was really the beginning of the fall of this uh, regional aviation. So there is lots of returns to scales in, in the industry of aviation. It's in within the uh, airplanes, larger airplanes, more passengers per airplane will get you more profit and so. Larger airports uh, are more profitable than small airports and larger airlines are more profitable and can treat risk better than small airlines. So the process is towards few and large airports, airlines and so on. And that really meant that all those smaller aircrafts that we could see for regional elevation in the 60s and 70s and so, started in the 50s already, they have almost disappeared from the market. There are some uh, private jets or jet companies, taxi companies, charter companies like John Air or so, they're doing very well. But it has, so to say, the production of those has al almost stopped. And that is what Jerome talks about, talked about. There is a sign that this will come back, that there is a renewed interest for the smaller aircrafts. And this is also shown in the travel market, so to say, that the, the distance over which uh, um, aviation works is from 500 kilometers. This is in Sweden, and 600, 700 kilometers dominates. But on the smaller distances, beyond 400 kilometers, the flows are quite tiny. So what we're looking at, is it possible to increase that? The number of flights on very short distances, on Luxele, Vasa, on Skellefteå, Vasa, and so on. And then we use some different sort of mod models, and this is a graphical door-to-door uh, um, -door model. So if you go by car, you start from your home, and then you go directly with some speed, and if you go with um, 
uh, high speed train, you go to some railway station, and if you go with uh, uh, aviation, you go to an uh, airport. And then, so that time goes before you really start your trip, and then you have a higher speed, so you go farther away. And the electric air may come somewhere here. Perhaps it can be easier to approach the airplane, and you can go away f faster than with ordinary fossil uh, airplanes, smaller airplanes. Airplanes, but there are also a distance limit due to the batteries currently. So, so we will have some section here where electric uh, aviation will be competitive, and that will increase over time when we develop the, the system, so to say. And as you can see, that will be very similar to where high speed trains are competitive. So, there will be a, uh, a question here will, should we invest in very rigid railway systems or should we choose a more flexible mobile ava electric aviation system for, for our communication system? And as Jerome told us, this is on its way. And this will change completely how we will use our cities and our countryside within 20 years. So it's time to start in the planning process of cities and countryside to discuss where will they start, where will they land, how will they use their airspace, so to say. But aviation and regional policy acts within the policy context. Everything is very regulated within aviation. And there is lots of governmental interventions and pri priorities. So. And we fee so we have started to look into the regional transport policy of, of Sweden to begin with. We have also uh, looked into Finland and we are on the way to look into Norway that we'll come back to. And in Sweden, it's a completely mess. It's so much many actors that are involved in this and have their own ambitions. So it's very difficult to develop a regional public transport policy where aviation is a part. And currently, there is some sort, some procured uh, part of uh, aviation in Sweden, and that called regional aviation. But most of them goes to Stockholm, actually. There is one line from the station to Umeå where you can jump off. Those one, Hemavan, you cannot uh, jump off in Kramfors. You have to go to Arlanda and then back. So th there is, we call that a policy mistake. So why, why don't we can develop alternatives from Moirana, from Hemavan in Sweden to, to Umeå, to Vasa? or she left you to Jakobstad and so. Till, so. So we have to think not only about the aviations or the aircraft, so to say, we also have to think about the whole regulation and policy for regional transport policy. In Norway, they have a completely other system. They have a regional aviation system with lots of small airports. Perhaps it's extremely costly, it's, but they have, they have the fossil oil <laughs> that pays for this. We don't have, <laughs> we don't want, so we have to find other ways, so to say. But there is a possibility to have this sort of, of more local regional aviation. So, our conclusions here is that there is a possibility to develop uh, uh, an efficient regional transport policy for this region, but electric powertrains will not be enough, I would say. There is a need to other changes also. And as I showed you, there is a lot of policy failures in, in within northern Sweden also. The, how, the demand for, for this sort of, of uh, aviation has not been strong. So that has to come up. And there are uh, problems at national level also. And I think also there is, to some extent, an, uh, an appropriate technology and infrastructure for regional av aviation. aviation. We don't have developed small aircraft on a, during a long time. We have not developed small air ter terminals, airport terminals, that's very easy to go in and out of the airports. Nowadays, it's like if you go to Thai or, or uh, everyone you go to, every time you go to an airport, it's, you have to shop, you have to go farther away, so to say, high security systems. You, it's not like a bus stop, so to say, just to take me to the next city. So there is a need for policy changes. There's a need to, in Sweden at least, for changes of the law to get, make it possible to develop a regional transport system. And we can develop, the, continue our work with Nordic comparisons to see why is this different in different countries. And I also, this is a message to the Kvarken Council and to uh, this area. 
I think it's time. I mean, the Quarken Council has have a strong focus on the ferries, and that's been very good. And we have seen the new ferry. That's a really good example of how the region can develop transport possibilities. But I think also we have to broaden that spectrum to in take in aviation as part of this uh, new regional policy for the Quarken Council or for the Quarken region. Thank you. Thank you, Lars. So obviously you see potential for regional uh, airports and electric aviation, don't you? Yes, uh, yes, I see. And I think it will come. And, but I think there is a need to be very tough here because the, the increase in returns to scale. I mean, the large air, um, airlines want to get us far away. Mm. They do money if we go to Thai or we go to Japan or what we go to... United States and so. Mm. So we have to develop a new concept and, and new actors mm. that really also want to offer this local aviation system. And what is the potential for our region if we would have it? No, I think, I mean, to begin with, it's, you should be honest, it's, it will not change the world. Mm. I mean, we, can, we, the, we will decrease the, f uh, um, the environmental problem, of course. Mm -hmm. But then I think we can, if we have a, a, a multimodal system with not only the ferry, but also with aviation in the Quarken region, I think we can integrate the region better, we can use... Uh, returns to scales in companies and so, in higher education, within hospitals and so, and more and more meetings will be simp simplified. And that will, I think, will be uh, an injection to growth, growth for the region. Mm. Yeah. Interesting. Mm. Questions? If not, I say thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Next up, are my project colleagues, Andreas and Isaac. Andreas, you are, let's see, your head of department at Turens, Sweden. And you're also project manager for FAIR together with Ia Isaac, who is a strategy consultant at e Turens. Okay, guys, uh, you're gonna show us today why electric aviation, or maybe why not? Go ahead. Thank you, Anna. Uh, So we'll go directly to the region and uh, take a look at it to start off with. And uh, what actually strikes is it's that it's a cross-border region. It's got at least two big natural barriers. The sea between Sweden and Finland and the mountain ranges between Sweden and Norway. But what also you have to recognize is that the infrastructure system is really focused on north-south transportation. And the east-west links in this region are, are uh, much less developed, which actually gives us quite weak east-west communications. And the travel times follow thereafter. So it's, it's quite hard to move in this east-west corridor, actually. But on the upsides, there is a very mature cooperation, uh, which has been developed in a lot of uh, projects ever since, I think, it started to really speed up since the EU introduction and the interreg programs. So people have a, a quite a good uh, cooperation in this region, which I think is uni unique and is crowned by a, actually a joint traffic strategy, how to develop uh, the transports in this region. But there are more things happening, which is worth mentioning, mentioning, I think, and it's also the low carbon energy production, which is, uh, really a massive uh, good thing in this region uh, that we could produce this sustainable energy uh, fueling the future mobility uh, and also the future industry and in particular the emerging green industry in this region and uh, the whole uh, value chain of the, the battery production I would say which is really a, a hot and interesting topic. But then back to the topic we are talking about today, and that is why electric aviation uh, could be a really good fit for this region. Uh, and that is, of course, links to the E2S communications uh, and the, 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 the good part about this new technique uh, linked to electric aviation, which is said to state, of course, increased accessibility. And you would say that, of course, aviation travels fast 
uh, related to other transport modes like rail and as Lars showed, uh, cars uh, and such. But also the state of the comet a lower environmental impact uh, and also lower cost due to more effective engines but also less maintenance need because of uh, less moving parts in the electrical engine actually. So we're not just project managers, it's also had the opportunity to actually do some research ourselves and that is, what, that is what we will talk about further down in this presentation and we'll actually focus on these three areas. So if you start up with increased accessibility, you can analyze it in different ways, but we have been using in this picture travel quotas. Uh, we're still developing this a bit, but this is travel quotas picture between aviation. This could be actually fossil fuel aviation as well as electric aviation uh, related to car, travel time for cars between these nodes. And in this particular example, we start off in Kokla Pietesari, Vasa and Seineyoki, and it's a one to everybody relation. And we have such uh, diagrams as well for the Swedish nodes in the project and also for the Norwegian nodes. But I think this shows pretty much the same kind of picture as Lars showed, you know, the transport diagram with different modes. What you actually see is that aviation is quite competitive in a cross-border region. And you see the little red triangle in Finland that is showing actually that cars is quite competitive on shorter ranges. Uh, and that is because uh, we have, we have uh, assum uh, made some assumption. You travel at 400 kilometers an hour with air, but you also have a, a, punishment, a time punishment of 100 minutes in order to simulate transfer. And of course, if you could shorten that interval, aviation would be even more competitive and that is perhaps why we also need to talk about electric vertical uh, takeoff and landing vehicles, um, eVTOLs. But what we see in this picture is that you might get up to four times uh, faster traveling times. Uh, and that's the blue lines and the green lines is about double as fast as cars, while we don't have that many yellow and red is of course a bit slower than uh, than compared to a car. All right, uh, then we will move on to talk a little bit about the environmental impact. I'd say that that is uh, one of the main uh, arguments for electric aviation, of course. Um, electric aircrafts, as uh, all other electrified transports, have uh, zero operational emissions. Uh, however, of course, there are emissions related to producing the energy and producing the aircrafts themselves and the maintenance of the aircrafts. So what we have been doing in the project, what we're actually doing right now, I would say, this is some preliminary results, but um, is that we are looking at the life cycle, uh, life cycle analysis of uh, the climate impact of electric aviation, and we have compared it in this slide to fossil aircraft that you see on the right side, and uh, compared to other electrified transport modes such as trains and electric cars. And what we see is that uh, with the Nordic energy mix, we have a really low climate impact from uh, the whole life cycle of an electric aircraft. Uh, it's really cl close to uh, the climate impact of trains, I would say. Uh, but what we also see is that uh, the energy mix is really important. Uh, we have studied both with Nordic energy mix and with the EU average energy mix. Uh, and there we see that it will be a lot better with, with the Nordic, with the low carbon energy production that um, Andreas mentioned earlier, and that is also, I would say, a message from the project to this region to keep investing in, in uh, low carbon energy production. Uh, one other thing to mention is that the maintenance of the airplanes in includes, of course, uh, replacing batteries uh, when so necessary, and uh, the production of batteries today I would say is uh, quite energy intensive uh, and that is also something I think for this region to be uh, 
quite proud of the investments uh, now being made in the battery sector. And I think with the more sustainable energy or more sustainable battery production in this region, that could also be something that will be good for the development of electric airplanes as well. Uh, then another part of this and what makes it, I would say, interesting for regional uh, aviation, as uh, Lars mentioned earlier, uh, the possible new rise of regional aviation. I'd say that is uh, because of the more efficient uh, motors and the lower need for maintenance for electric aircrafts means that the costs uh, for operating air electric aircrafts will be lower compared to uh, conventional aircrafts of the same size. And that would also mean that the cost per passenger will be lower. So we could have more competitive uh, ticket prices. And if you look at the costs of facing an airline for operating a route, that is both the fixed costs, uh, including capital costs, which could be higher for new technology initially, uh, but then it's the operational costs and there you have the fuel and maintenance costs which are really a big part of, of the operational economics. And we see that in terms of the total cost per passenger, we could be, in this uh, fictional example, we could be somewhere 5% lower cost per passenger. Uh, but if you just look at the operational costs, you could be as much as uh, up to maybe 30% lower oper operational cost per passenger. Uh, and that implicates that a high utilization of these aircrafts is a uh, key. And there is will, where you will get the uh, most economic advantages. And uh, what we've done is just to show you a, an example in this region to go from Skellefteå in Sweden to Kokkola in Finland and see uh, compared to a, a car, uh, of course, really uh, drastically improved uh, travel time, uh, but also compared to a petrol car, you have a, a lot better climate uh, impact as well, and the costs will be um, approximately at, at the same level, I would say. But then from the society side, you could argue that the, this is worth something to the society. The time savings uh, for the people who are traveling is worth something. And uh, in cost-benefit analysis of uh, the transport administration, they use uh, some numbers for this, and we have just made uh, simple calculations based on this to see that the time savings and the, uh, the uh, carbon savings could be worth about 300 euros per person for for the society. So there's a really, could be an incentive for public actors to uh, engage in this question. Uh, then I would just like to sum up that uh, what we are doing in this project, we are uh, ending the project this year and we are just in the middle of trying to sum up our results. Uh, and we have been focused on what does it take to be early? What does an early implementation of electric aviation take? And we have been focusing on what the financers of this project should be doing. And those include the airports of the region, the power companies and public uh, authorities, as well as uh, private sector organizations. Uh, so there will be a lot of different measures that we will suggest. Uh, I think Lars has mentioned a few things around policy. We will hear more about the necessary investments in terms of airport infrastructure soon. Uh, but we also see that uh, this has been the first step and there will really be, uh, I think, grounds for further investigations as well. All right, I think we'll stop there. Thank you. So clearly there is a business potential and there is a potential for the public sector. And now we've been talking about this, that it's good for the region, it's good for the development, but do we know anything about the demand? 
Do people want this? Do businesses want this? It's a really good question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, it's a uh, good thing to think uh, about. Of course, we've discussed it a lot in the, in the, um, in the project, but it's also a question, I think, to, today to the audience, because what we are actually mapping is much the potential what it could be. And what Isaac also showed in the calculus earlier uh, about societal gains is actually what you could gain if a person would want to travel this and use this kind of new transport mode. So we're also really keen to discuss that question. How big is the demand? Mm. Uh, and it's kind of hard to also to demand, uh, to see what the demand is when this is a technology which isn't really available right now. Mm. Could just add, I think uh, the consumer preferences might be different for regional aviation compared to long distance aviation and for sustainable aviation compared to the conventional aviation. I think that could maybe be somewhat uh, different uh, preferences from consumers or from travelers. Yeah, I guess so too. So what we need is feedback. And if we don't get it today, I hope we will get it soon. Yes, go ahead. Could you make calculations about Please. these costs? Thanks. When you made these calculations about the costs, how did you make it? With the pilots or without the pilots? It is just all electric way and somebody is just coding the route or is there pilots? In our calculations, we have uh, assumed that uh, there will be pilots, uh, and uh, I think that uh, the the first generation, I think, due to the security uh, the, the security standards of the of the uh, industry, I think uh, it will be necessary to keep that in the equation for some time. Thank you. Thank you. One more question. Well, I'm not asking more questions, but I do have a reflection on the question of the demand, what people would think, what consumer would think. Um, I think there is a big potential for the electric application, but we have to remember it's also dependent on other infrastructure um, the region or the city would offer. For example, suppose we go to a destination in uh, the Kavatkan region, but the other infrastructure like public transportation or all the other things are not in line. So people will end up there, but it's so not convenient for them to go where they want to go. Um, so I think the issue is also all the other infrastructure provided by the region is allied. Yeah, thank you. I'd say that's a great point and uh, really important to uh, make this an integrated system uh, with the, all, all the transport modes of the region. Yes. And this is something we've been working in in several projects, connecting multimodality, but we're not there yet. So it's a very good point. Another question. Yeah. Um, so I would like to make a further comment on the demand issue. So um, what we feel, we, I'm from into Seinjoki, from Seinjoki region. So um, we've been already considering also um, to start creating demand between different cities, also in the Quarken region, but with our other partners. So that's how we could actually also see the pot f uh, future potential what comes to business uh, travel or even tourism travel or education travel. So these are the three areas that we would like to focus on in mm. the future. Very good. Yes. Yeah. So maybe we also need to push. We can't just sit back and wait. Okay. As I see it, we have time for some uh, refreshments uh, and the program will continue in 15 minutes. Please help yourself with coffee and fruits and we'll get back at um, 10 sharp. Thank you.
Okay, let's see if we get people back. Your flight is leaving, my friends, so please find your seat. Time to sit down. Okay, welcome back. Uh, next up we have Arne, Arne Smedberg, uh, CEO for Biofuel Region. Now you're going to tell us a bit about charging, aren't you? And yes, char yes, 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 you are. Yes. And usually one says a penny for your thoughts, but I think you could get more than a penny for this because this is also very important. Please. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, very nice to be here. And I come from Bifield region and we have a long history of uh, having a cross-border project with the Vasa area and uh, other places here in the, uh, the Vasa region. So it's really nice to be here. And um, I work for Biofield Region, and we have like we work with uh, development, um, bioeconomy, and also uh, low carbon uh, a vehicle fleet. And uh, the project can be uh, about a lot of things, very broad but very interesting. And now I've gone into deep with this um, flying around. And that has been really nice. We have been almost for two years discussing this, and uh, we have done a technical overview report last uh, summer, and now we're going to have a regional report of this area. And the area is like they have told you: Norway is Finland, Sweden, and in Norway they are they are checking up all the airports and how they can bring electricity to them. And they really want to be in phase when the plane, the electric planes is arriving. And they have a kind of nice, uh, as Lars showed you, that they have this route, this short route system. So they have uh, maybe easier to calculate how much flying there will be uh, compared to maybe to Finland. There's no overall plan, but we think that the first place will be Kukula Airport and we will go there and check it out today, I think, or tomorrow, today. And in Sweden, there's a lot of activities. Uh, and we, in Sweden, we have this other system. We have Svedavia, who has the biggest airports, and then they have the regional network that has a lot of airports, but they are financed by the uh, local municipality or something. So they kind of different uh, types of... Uh, but Svedavia, they are trying to fix the, the route uh, between Östersund and Umeå. And the regional airports, we'll hear about Robert later, and he's, al he's, always, he's already there. <laughs> so we'll see what, the, what they have done there. Very interesting. And the, the, the needs for the, for the airports, they... It's, uh, they have to do s some investment program and check out what, what do you have to do to fix the infrastructure. And it could be other things that, that charging. It could be other things that they have to do because of the... I mean, when you have smaller planes, it's, it's more planes on the field. So you have to manage all those planes. And the turnaround times, it's about 30 minutes a day. And we are really interested if you, we can manage those 30 minutes. And you have to have a dialogue with the operators. Uh, they, I mean, they who will fly the aircraft and also the, the builders of the aircrafts. And we have really tried to put those, um, open this dialogue because we realized that you have to do it before the, the airplane will, will, will be standing there on the airfield. And also look at the new routes and understand uh, the routes and where to go with those new aircrafts. 
Uh, and the, the charging standard, they are in an early stage, but we, um, we think that it'll be about the same as you have for the heavy traffic. And we will see uh, an example later. And uh, I mean, it's also, if you, if you invest in something, you, you really want the investment to be used when, when you're ready. So they, you don't buy a lot of charges and no one uses them. Um, and we think that the, the charging system will not be a very big problem, but maybe to build it at all the regional airports could be a problem. Here you can see the, today the, the Pipis Trail is already there in like in Sholeftio, where you can fly them, and you see the Pipis Trail charger on the, on the right side, and it's, it's not a very big charger, it's not the, the, the big that you need later when the, when the bigger aircraft will come. And if you see about the aircraft, as I said, about the 30 minutes, uh, if you have a 30 minutes uh, turnaround, you maybe you get 20 minutes of charging. And uh, then you should have a charge between around 350 kilowatts up to 1200 somewhere. We have made some calculation about that. And this could be a problem with the tempering of the batteries. We've seen it on the, the cars, that if you want a high charging speed, you have to have the batteries really tempered about 20 degrees, and that could be an implication. And we have um, put the parameters like you charge maybe from about 30 or 40 up to 85, 90% uh, filling up the batteries. You, you, you can never go so much lower because of the security. And it's hard to get over 85 because the, the power it gets, gets down on the batteries. You can't charge them so much, it gets lower. And you have to have a reserve. You can't go down empty. I mean, you maybe not need anything, any batteries to get down, but it's, it's not allowed to go down on a, a zero level. Uh, that's a regulation. I mean, that's the same today. You have to have fuel left to go to another airport if, the, if there's a problem with the, the weather or something. And here on the pictures, you see the, the charger at the Pipistrel and also in the cockpit. I had the opportunity to fly with the plane in Schleftio in uh, August, and it was really interesting. Um, uh, and it's, if you are interested in electricity, you. Eh, it's really nice because when you're going out with the plane and you, st you just stop the engine, I mean, you stop the engine on an electric plane, but you don't do it on, in a fossil uh, com conventional. So the, the propeller stops, <laughs> but you still runs. It's really nice. And when you, you feel when you're flying, it's really low uh, energy consumption. If you flat fly and you go down, you, you almost can go and get the other way. You get the energy from the outside. So it's very interesting. Um, and um, it's, it's important to put the charges um, somewhere it's near the plane so you don't have so many long cables because it could be a, a lot of effect losses then. And uh, the connections then must be simple and uh, we, we don't really know how they are thinking because maybe you have some kind of um, uh, robot system who puts them on the plane when you have bigger planes. You maybe have seen the ferries in uh, like between Sweden and uh, Denmark. They have like uh, common ABB robots that puts that puts put them in the charger position. So, but we don't really know. But you see here, it's a it's a common. You just put it in as, as you do in a car. And it's important with flexibility. I mean, it's hard to just put one charger just for one plane. So there has to be that, that all the planes can use the same chargers because the, the operators can't bring their own chargers at the airport. And here's, uh, we have put an example. We go from, we fly, just think, fly from Vasa to Umeå and then to Vilhelmina and uh, Hemava and then to Morana. And we, we, we fly with one, 19 pa passenger heart um, and another nine passenger aviation Alice. 
They have like the different size and different range. And we have different kind of chargers from 350, 700 and 1200. And as I said before about estimation of uh, level of uh, charging, uh, as, as you say, from 40 about to 90. And this is, this is an esti estimation and it's just an example uh, of a route. And you can see here when we calculate this, you see the time that they, the charging time that they will need. So this is just charging time, it's, it's not the turnaround time. And if here we have the like biggest charge in Vasa and Umeå and Murana, and then we have like smaller charge in the smaller airports. And here you can see how much you have when you leave and how much energy you have uh, when you are going down. And so the limit, we put it on 40%. So you see here, but um, in Vilhelmina you have 43 when you're landing and um, it differs, but, but the interesting is how uh, long you stay at the tarmac, at the terminal. So you get uh, a view of how big charges you must have with this airplane. Uh, and you, if you have half the power, you get the double time about. And this is also, I mean, you have to have some kind of temperation on the, on the batteries to get this kind of quite fast charging. And if you look at the uh, uh, smaller airplane, nine passenger per airplane, you see that the, the range is a lot better on this plane, so it's they, they almost not necessary to charge that much because it's, it's a, a long range, but also it's a smaller plane. But it's, it's really a lot of parameters that you have to fill in and when you start to do it, you start thinking about how, to, um, how big the charges you, you, you should have at each airport. And I mean, if you're an airport that has a lot of electric flights coming, you have to get more, more, maybe more. And then it's another problem, how do you, who will have the most power, who? So there are some uncertainties in this. Uh, as we, you asked before, Anna, we don't know the market will look like. But we heard here from the audience in the FICA pause that uh, there will be a lot of demand from the battery belt, so that, that will be nice. Timing, it has to be in time. All the infrastructure and cooperation. You have to, all, the, all the airports have to have good cooperation with the suppliers of power and start talking now. Um, lead times for the upgrading of power at airports. I mean, it could take a long time. Coordination of all systems. Uh, and uh, future work, I mean, we're not ready yet. We will continue this uh, project and hopefully we'll have some more pro projects. We think we need it because the planes are coming about 2026. 20, um, look at possible flight routes. That, that I showed was just an example. And there could be, I mean, the demand is giving the routes. Uh, yeah, and also continue this dialogue that we think we have started, and it's really important to know. And also this about the battery energy storage. Maybe it could be better in some airports to have a battery energy storage. You, then you don't need to have a so big power connection. But still, it's quite expensive, but hopefully it will get cheaper. And it's also very mobile. And the financing, I mean, the charging station is one thing. Uh, and it's also, uh, is, I mean, hopefully there will be some nice financing. We have looked at that, but we will look more into it. And also the financing of the aircraft. I mean, they cost a lot more to an old school um, fossil aircraft. So. There, I think there must be in the beginning some kind of uh, financing system for it. And um, this is a lot of people are looking at it now. Now, the next point we have is the workshop with all the uh, airports here in May. Here's a future picture of how it can look in the future. Uh, On-site renewable production, interesting. So, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Arne. 
So obviously, the technique won't be the problem. Am I right? Um, could be some problem, but I think we'll solve it. Mm. We can solve it, yes. Mm. Uh, just quickly, um, you mentioned the dialogue with the airports and the one providing the energy. Can you tell us something more about the discussion going on there? What are they talking about? What are the key um, issues? I think it's a very... Um, I mean, all the airfields have different problems and they can have different opportunities. So you have to check it out for your own with your own uh, network uh, company. Mm. Okay, thank you. Questions? No? Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Next up, we will go live to, 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 to Antti Mäenpä from the University of Vasa. Antti, can you hear us? But we can't hear you, so maybe you're muted. Hello? We see your Hello. lips moving. Yes, now we hear you. Can you hear can us? You? Okay. Yeah, I yes. can hear you. So the I have been hearing you all. I have been listening to you all the time, so I kind of know now what you have been discussing already. That's great. Good. Uh, now, Antti, you focus on innovation and regional development, don't you? Uh, and yeah. I would argue that our region has come quite far when it comes to regional collaboration. Are you with me on that? Yeah, and I think that one good example of this is this gold label for this cluster that we, we heard news in the Monday. So definitely we are on a good track. Great, great. Now, please, I'll give you the stage and you'll tell us more about a new industry in the Kvarken. Please. Thanks. I can't hear, I can see the slides, so are they visible to you? Slides are visible. Yes. Okay, I, I cannot, yeah, now I can see them. Yeah, good. Yeah, we, we already had a good discussion and I think a lot of these issues have already been discussed by my colleagues. They are also very eager, as I'm eager to participate now with you about the subject and this demand has already risen up in the discussions and I just kind of like try to lift up some ideas concerning what this demand perhaps could be. Of course, we already discussed about the tourism and what it might offer, for example, and what is the consumers uh, considerations concerning electric aviation might be but of course we might have this industrial interest as well and one way to of course very very simple way of perhaps thinking this is to think about the components themselves that go into the electric planes we already for example know some uh, some companies in in the in the energy cluster in, in Vasa that are working with electric motors and electric uh, motor uh, related um, components so perhaps they might be interested to work collaborate with this new industry of course we also have these services and traveling uh, opportunities which uh, might help a lot in in the future and might op offer new opportunities for sustainable tourism activities for example so there is a lot actually quite many things that this uh, potential collaboration uh, could consist of either regarding the planes themselves and things related to those or or something else surrounding the planes or, or uh, other uh, services connected to them. But please go to the next slide. And this is basically, I have tried to map a little bit about what sort of interesting activities are happening within this uh, region. This is th this picture does not now include Norway, so this is a little bit older picture, but it shows kind of like the, the potential that is there and definitely this is related with 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 the battery industry which was already uh, already mentioned before so of course there is no, lots of ongoing battery activities in the future uh, starting in the region and this will of course also involve lots of different types of experts and something which is really interesting is that of course the, all of these battery uh, factories are nearby uh, 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 these uh, airports so a need for this sort of expert uh, expert uh, traveling options probably might be something in the future. But this is, of course, also when, when we think about this ferry project and how, how successful it has been, that, of course, there is like a potential to even build, start building or thinking about this sort of sustainable, uh, sustainable um, traveling 
uh, uh, cluster to, alongside energy cluster in the future. And of course, this might offer some opportunities as well. Uh, also, of course, this might link with the hydrogen developments that are happening alongside this. So there's lots of interesting things happening surrounding the region that could, could perhaps be uh, linked with this electric aviation happening. And this is something which I, I started to think when hearing today's presentations uh, is that if we think about that, indeed, the energy cluster is very successful and got this gold label. And one, one very important ingredient of this success is collaboration, definitely. Then I, I started to think that what would happen or how important this electric aviation could be in making this innovative region a little bit larger. So connecting to Sweden and to Norway and to enhancing these sort of collaborations in the future. This is probably the most interesting question or, or question that I could ask from, from the audience as well. Do you see that it might have some sort of role in this? And please continue to the next slide. This is the original question, but I think that you kind of addressed this already. So, so you, you asked about this demand, but how do you see it? Do you see that it would link with some of perhaps your existing activities? Or do you see that it could play a role in enhancing this innovative region to include Sweden and Norway more integrally as well? Thanks. OK, thank you. That's our, that are some good questions. And before we turn to the audience, I would like to ask you, because we have the new ferry between Vasa and Uma, and some might argue that maybe we don't need both electric aviation and the ferry. What is your response to them? Now you're muted again. Wait, Antti, we can't hear you. Now? No? Yeah. Now, uh, yes. Okay. Yeah, I just asked that, Do can you have too much collaboration? And if you even if you have like these fast opportunities offered by this electric aviation are really interesting. I think one prime example is actually our, our uh, group or our research group that is now traveling across Finland today and tomorrow to meet our partners. With electric planes, we might have perhaps made this trip in one day, but now it takes two. So if this happens with other industries and other projects and activities. What will it change? Good point. Good point. Do I get some comments or reflections on that? I think we all agree, obviously, since nobody says anything. That's, I take it as a yes. Antti, I thank you. Uh, get well soon. And um, yeah, let's thanks. go to the next one. Thank you. Let's see if we get the screen to work. Yeah. Okay. Last but not least, as they always say, Robert Lindberg. You're the CEO at Schlefte Airport, and you really are in the front line when it comes to electric, electric aviation because you really know that it works, don't you? Yeah. We. I, I, I'm so impressed that the, the former speakers that. And that's uh, so important that we all need each other because they focus on, on the, the research and development and see all the, the problems can, and, and uh, solutions that we don't make mistakes in the future. But I'm not that kind of behind. I never went to the university. <laughs> <laughs> and you will notice that in a few minutes. But so, so, uh, so I don't like papers at all. So, so, so then we just do things <laughs> instead. Sounds great. Uh, but still, in uh, the kickoff of this project, you told the audience that you can't just lean back when it comes to these things. You have to act. And now you will tell us how. Yeah, thank you. And I see that the picture that I sent was about 20 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, nice to see you all and, and, and nice to be here. And I'm so thrilled that eventually meeting people. I do, used to, in my work, professional go a lot of times to meet airlines around the world a couple of times a week and now I've been sitting in, in Schlefte and Butresk in two years. Um, it's a beautiful place but I'm fed up. Um, the start. This is not a project, this is a change of society. Um, 
and I think it in two perspectives. Uh, in one perspective, we have the climate. We need to do something about the climate. And it's you and me that needs to do it, not somebody else. Um, and then we have also the change of society in a, in a Scandinavian, northern Scandinavian perspective during what's happening. We are thinking that in Schleftio, in Boden, Luleå, and Gällivare, there will be a hundred thousand new inhabitants. It's a demand, it's, and it's a struggling to see that this will work. We have the, the battery belt and everything that will happen with the green energy. That's why we need to work together in the puzzle. Every piece is needed. And it's airports, regions, municipalities, uh, countries and, and states and universities, everything needs to be worked together. In Schlefte we have this small factory, <laughs> small and small. Uh, this, the lake in the foreground is about the size of Friends Arena, the national arena in Sweden. It's, uh, it's really huge and if you haven't been there, please do, it's uh, in, uh, impressive. It will have about 360 megawatts, about over 3,000 uh, workers, and it covers three times the size of Pentagon or three times the size of all town in Stockholm. Uh, and it's happening now, today. They are there building. A lot of Finnish pe uh, people, Finnish uh, companies are there and, and welding, and, and some part of the structure is opening. Um, and for us, this is a high scenario, I think. but of course, I, I'm leaning a lot forward. But, but for, for us, is, is, this is happening. We can see that in the future, an, an, another city as the size of Kiruna is moving in. And it creates new demands. That's why we need to do the puzzle. Me and you together. Um, and what have we done in Schlefter Airport? Yeah, uh, this picture is fast uh, because I think it's really funny to see who wants to change or who wants change. Everybody wants change, but nobody wants to change. I, I'm, be, I, I'm, I'm a bit. I'm, I have a little study by myself. I've been when I fill up my car in Sweden with 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 diesel. Um, I see if because there are two handles there. One is the, the ugly diesel, and one is the fossil-free diesel. It's there right now at the petrol station. Nobody takes the fossil-free diesel. Why? Do we want to change the climate, or do we want to talk about changing climate? This is really important. Why do I know this picture is working? Yeah, I've been um, engaged six times, and they want to change. <laughs> <laughs> Um, in 2014, we made this master plan, and this master plan I'm so proud of. Uh, it's all the things, are st many things that are in the master plan are really wrong. Uh, we didn't have the COVID pandemic, uh, but we pro had a good prognosis, and we did it as a, as a, a picture book because we wanted a lot of politicals to read it, uh, and. We, we were also saying that we will take responsible for the, the climate, and it was 2014. Then we did a lot of things, uh, uh, as you see. We have an infrastructure uh, investment plan, and one of them was also to be fossil-free airport. In 2020, we went to be fossil-free airport. I think the first in the world. It was quite easy. It was fossil-free heating, renewable green energy, and fossil-free fuel and electric uh, vehicle. It wasn't that hard. It was changing the fuel, changing the, the electricity to certificate green electricity. It was a, a sign of the piper, and then it was done. Uh, everybody can do that. Every company can do that, quite easy. We. Uh, looked into sustainable aviation fuel and we bought the sustainable aviation fuel and we got the municipality to take in, in the policy that every journey they will make will be with 100% sustainable fu aviation fuel. And also Schlefte Kraft has made the same decision. Is that hard to do? No, quite easy. Everybody can do it. Every flight you can do, can you do by sustainable aviation fuel. 
Um, and also we build this structure that is uh, probably the world's most uh, powerful electric supply for aviation. It's one megawatt, 400 volt capacity, and it's on site and up and running. And due to that investment, we got an other uh, investment that was coming. It was Green Flight Academy that started the world's first sustainable flight academy. And it's something wrong in this picture that Green Flight Academy has not two pipistrels, they have now three. The, the third came last Saturday. So we have three electric aircraft up and running in Schleftio right now. You can go and fly with them next week, next month, next in the summer, it's no problem. The future is here now. Um, and we also have a project in cooperation with Northvolt and Schleftekraft that we will see that we will have uh, electric uh, EV tools, vertical takeoff and landing vehicles go from Schleft Airport to Northvolt site. And I will tell you that the first large EV tool will fly this summer. So the future is here now. And in a couple of weeks, we will also announce that we will be working with hydrogen, with the companies for developing hydrogen aircraft. And the last picture, why? Back to the puzzle. The puzzle is so important here. And I heard the question about demands, and, the, and, and it's so important to see that the future isn't like we used to do. We, we don't need to go to Stockholm to do business. We can do business with each other. Um, we have some, some routes that are Wilhelmina, Lyck, Umeå, Gällivare, Skellefteå. In, in Gällivare we have one of the biggest mines owned by Boliden, Aitik. And Boliden has their, their melting uh, in, in Skellefteå and their, their headquarters in Skellefteå. How many people do you think sitting by car don't know about each other? A lot. In, in Wilhelmina and Umeå, I can say that up, most likely over 100 people don't know about each other driving cars every day from the municipality, companies and, and, and organization. And I, I don't have a dream. The dream was long ago. I have a plan. And the plan is that we will, this autumn, start the first uh, sustainable aviation route flying between Sweden and Finland. This is the plan. And I will see that it will be happening probably in August. And this is so important that we can see that we can develop things, but also see that we can work together and creating the new battery belt. Thank you. Thank you. So obviously the potential is big and we can think as we have, we need to shift to something totally new, right? So if we do this, you talked about it some, but tell us more, what will this do to our region? I'm, I'm, I'm so, um, I've been in the business for 20 years. I've been a chairman of Schleft de Kraft, and I, but I've been at the airport for 20 years. And I, I'm so, f uh, when, when we see things happen for real. Uh, everybody talked to, said to me that I was a fool when we started a route between Schleftio and Barcelona because I went to, to an airline, a <laughs> big Swedish airline, <laughs> and said, oh, I want to start a route between Schleftio and Barcelona. And they said, you are crazy. <laughs> it's 800 people annually going between Schleftio and Barcelona. Yeah, no, but because there is no route. And they looked at historic data, and then we started a route, and it was 20,000. Uh, and, and I think what we are doing today, we have in 60 years, as Lars said, uh, struggle going north and south, everything to Stockholm. Mm. If I want to do business with a company, with a big architect firm, I'm probably going to Stockholm. Mm. I don't look at what's happening in Vasa, what's happening in Wilhelmina, what's happening in Kiruna. 
So all this will create inter-regional business and inter-regional transportation that will be for benefit for our Nordic countries. Mm. And when talking about saving the cl climate, we also need to sacrifice, don't we? Yeah, yeah, we need to sacrifice. Mm -hmm. And and what we most, uh, I hope everybody here go home and, 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 and rethink that, okay, I will change the handle with the petrolization. We have to do things. Mm -hmm. we, we can't uh, depend on ever, not somebody else will do it. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Thank you. Do we have any questions from the audience? We do. Please, read them. Thank you. It's always so inspiring to listen to you. There are four to five months to August. What do you see as the biggest struggle or challenge before that flight is moving here around? Uh, convincing people, <laughs> uh, but but uh, but uh, I'm 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 working on it. So I think this is what we are doing today. See that that uh, of, of course we have a, a future with, with digital meetings, uh, and but f meeting people has always been important for the progress of humanity. We didn't solve the the apartheid in South Africa by teams, so. So I think that it's a really important that we s s see that we will be working together. So, but now we have a case. We have the battery belt and, and, and the cooperation between countries. So, so far it's been really, really easy. But of course, it's a lot of, lot of investment, but we have to start with a small scale. What we are looking at is two days a week that we can have a short trip over and save time and have, have sustainability in three ways. The social sustainability, the envi environmental and the economic sustainability that, that you can meet and, and also go have back to your family or, or your work at some day. So th this is uh, convincing people is, is the, but that's why I'm still spitting on their stone. <laughs> Very good, thank you. More questions? No? Thank you, Robert. Uh, we <laughs> we actually already reached the end of our uh, day, but I would still, because we have these cle clever people here today, I would like to ask you, do you have something to add still? Some comment, some thought? Now you heard the questions from the audience, you heard your colleagues. What is your feeling? No. Yes. La good, Lars. Take it. Always time to talk. Always. Well, I think there was a question here about the uh, integration of uh, transportation of dif the different modes, and I think that's really important to develop because if, as Jerem showed us, if we should have this door-to-door -door travel system via different airports with different sort of uh, transportation. Uh, possibilities, then we really need an integrated uh, uh, public transport system for the region. So it's so when I start in Vasa and want to go to Skellefteå, I can, as here I'm show you, I can click in here and there and there, and I know there will be a bus if there is a bus. I know there will be a taxi, and I know there will be an EV tool where I need it, so to say. And I can plan this uh, trip journey very smoothly. Mm. And I think that that, that really is a demanding that we, uh, it could be done already, but it hasn't been done. And when we get the electric aviation, the aircrafts and the EV tools, that should just be to add to that existing system. Hmm. So that for the region, we have a common, because now, I mean, you have to book your taxi to the ferry and you go with the ferry and then there is another um, um, uh, taxi or a bus or so and then, if you should go further up to Lixel or so, you'd have to book something else. I think that integrated, as someone talked about, mm. system is very important. And that's a policy, that's something that policy had to do with. And someone wants to change the system, as uh, we heard here, mm. to make this really integrated. Mm. So that's my comment. Very good. And thank, thank you, you for everything. Thank you. Anyone else of our speakers? You emptied everything. In that case, 
uh, I would like to round off. Uh, before, uh, please follow us. We have different kind of uh, communication channels. We have a web page and we have LinkedIn and we have a really interesting YouTube channel where you can listen to other experts, the experts we had here today and get more information about what's going on, what's coming, what is already here. Then, last but not least, is our final conference, which is approaching in September. It will be held in Shelefto, and you will get more information on that on our web page, for example. With these words, I will say we heard a lot of interesting thoughts today, food for thoughts, so, so, so to speak. I think we have potential here in our region to really be a forerunner, and we have people who want to do that. With that, I thank, thank our speakers and our audience, and um, let's continue talking. Thank you. <laughs>